Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of What's Important Now, the podcast from the United States Border Patrol Academy, where we're talking about things that are important to the men and women of the United States Border Patrol, their families, and those that we serve. Today we have with us John Eric Morris, affectionately known to those of us that have known him for quite a while as Mo. <laughs> now, Mo is the director of the CDP Office of Intelligence Transna Transnational Organized Crime Division. Now, everybody knows that CDP is the largest federal law enforcement organization in the country, in excess of 60,000 men and women dedicated every day to keeping this country and its people and our way of life safe. Did you know that CDP has its own Office of Intelligence? Well, that's where Mo works. Mo, first off, thanks for being here. Hey, I really appreciate the, the opportunity, Chief. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be able to be here, uh, and it's good seeing you again. I know it's been a while, so I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. So, uh, you know, our paths have crossed for 20-plus uh, years now. Yes, sir. It, and, and I always, I'm always fascinated with the, with, the, with the gigs that you land. You end up doing <laughs> some of the most interesting things. That, uh, and what you're doing right now is just, it, it's actually pretty amazing. So that we can kind of get everybody off on the, on the same foot. Sure. Talk a little bit about what CDP's Office of Intelligence is and does in terms of, everybody knows we have Border Patrol, sure. we have the Office of Field Operations who operate at the ports of entry, we have the Office of Air and Marine, or Air and Marine Operations rather. We also have the Office of Intelligence among yep. others. Talk about that. So what the Office of Intelligence does is we leverage those collective subject matter experts that are out there in the field uh, and create a, a picture of what's going on across CBP as a whole. Um, reaching down into those individual sectors and regional intelligence centers uh, and our partners out there in the field and we take all of that information and we provide that to whatever stakeholder can use that information to bring a desired effect to, for, the, for all of us as a whole. Uh, I know stepping into that role it was new for me uh, coming from the field in a, in a different roles and not really knowing all of the um, outstanding support that the Office of Intelligence does to not only the CBP family, but uh, providing information out there to the intelligence community and not only within the United States, but abroad as well. Yeah, because national security, especially after 9-11, that's a team sport. Yes, you know, sir. And nobody operates in a vacuum anymore. And to yes, be able sir. to really leverage everybody's capabilities and, and put the bad guys in jail and keep bad things from happening... There has to be that communication, that collaboration that takes place across multiple agencies. And so the Office of Intelligence for CDP is actually on the forefront of that effort. Yes, sir. And being able to take those individual regions and then getting and gaining a regional picture of what's going on. So think of each one of those, whether it's a sector, a region, or an area, that is that is where they work day in and day out. And they know that area intimately what Office of Intelligence does, and, and talk specific, transnational organized crime specifically, is we take that information and not only a, and to create that, that regional picture, but a trans-regional picture for our leadership so they can make those decisions on where they need to prioritize assets uh, as we move to address the border. So we're talking about cr transnational organized crime. Yes, what sir. do we mean when we say that? So transnational organized crime is not only what we have locally affecting us at those very specific areas, but how these organizations are a network. And remember, to, de to defeat a network, you need to have your own network, right? And I'm not the one that came up with that, but it's true. Mm -hmm. And these, these actual transnational criminal organizations work day in, day out with unlimited budgets to attack the United States of America. So cartels. Uh, terrorist organizations cartels terrorist organizations criminal organizations themselves so think of the the money that is made within the narcotics and the human smuggling and human trafficking that is not only uh, endemic to what we have here on our in the western hemisphere but how that spreads out to Europe and Asia as well so just to break it down at the at, at its base element it, when when folks hear on the news or they hear us say transnational criminal organizations we're essentially talking about those individuals and those groups and those networks that are responsible for the illicit traffic and illicit activity that takes place not only in the country but in globally the yeah and, and globally right and it's it's all interconnected and and it's been eye-opening for me to see how 
interconnected all of the, that those networks are on the criminal organization side. And knowing that every one of those organizations is working against us for their profit. They don't care about the individuals or the havoc in which they are wreaking on some of these these families and these uh, and these regions uh, or the United States. They have no care. All they care about is that bottom line money. Uh, money. And that's what it's what it boils down to. So safe to say, and this is a softball question, obviously, yep. because we know the answer to that. But but that's our real adversary. That's our enemy. Absolutely. The that that big dollar, whether it's a pound, whether it's the dollar, it's about these criminal organizations making money and exploiting any weaknesses they see within our capabilities to get their commodity across. Whether it's drugs, humans, weapons, it's all about profit. And that's how they, they take advantage of that. So more than anything, the American public that sees things on TV or they see uh, things that we put out on social media, what they typically see is the interdiction. It's sure. the uh, interdiction of the flow or the actual product, if you will, whether mm -hmm. we're talking about narcotics or other sure. substance or, uh, or even people being trafficked. They see us interdicting that. But that's not really the enemy. That's the product that's being mm -hmm. trafficked by the enemy, which is the cartels, the sure. smugglers. Those are essentially the bad guys that we're trying to stop the activity that they're doing. Remember, all of those things are just a, it's just a bell of marijuana. It's just a, a person. They don't even put it in a human category. They do not care. And those are, those are some of the tough things, is those war patrol agents out there on the line that we see day in and day out of how that bad guy is taking advantage of these people who just want to better their lives, right? And knowing they have no scruples, they do not care what happens to these individuals. They do not care. See, and I think that's important important to point out because I think that gets lost in the narrative sometimes of what's going on, particularly in instances like right now where we have a, a surge of activity at the border and we have a, a, a large influx of uh, immigrants entering the country illegally between the ports of entry. And sure. so that occupies a lot of media space and a lot of discussion space. At the end of the day, what we're really concerned about as law enforcement officers and, and everybody else that wears a badge are the threats. And the threats really are those that are responsible for that flow because they, as you say, they don't care what they're bringing in as long as it's making money. And some of the things that they bring in are really dangerous to this country and our people. So they, prior they, they prioritize how and what they are going to do, just like any business model does, right? So they know what has a certain price tag associated to it. And they they address that level of effort uh, to bring that specific commodity across. And they are willing to sacrifice that little profit because they have a different profit margin in this other specific category, whether it's a high value individual or somebody coming, a high value target or um, a, a special interest alien, they will sacrifice profit here to make sure that that comes across. And so when you say a high value target or, or a special interest alien, mm -hmm. what you're actually talking about is somebody that maybe has an ulterior and nefarious purpose for coming across, not just an economic oh, migrant, absolutely. somebody that has criminal background, somebody yes. that's a sexual predator, somebody that has malintent towards the people of this country. They're willing to sacrifice and, and send across uh, economic migrants in one area to get this other. Absolutely. And think about it at, at a, whether it's an offensive or defensive position. Uh, on the Border Patrol side, we're consistently on our heels, right? Because we have, we don't have offensive measures to go uh, against that, right? We're con consistently on our heel and reacting, right? So I could tell you the bad guys look. They just look. Just, just put it very simple. They look across the line and they see where the they see where the defensive linemen are, the linebackers and the corners, mm -hmm. cornerbacks, right? They see where the weakest spot is. They know how to manipulate that defensive line to get their sweep around to the left side. They know how to manipulate that, and we're constantly operating on the back of our heels um, because we're just reactive. And when we do have something like the crisis that we're seeing now, that defensive line continues to diminish. We don't even have that many guys on that defensive line for them to manipulate. So then it's just they free, have the advantage. They have the advantage. It's free. It's it's a man. It's it's a free area for them to go and operate in, and they just they honestly just manipulate us. And of course, you know what you're talking about. We have agents that are 
processing and having to take yes. care of the detainees instead of being out on patrol yes, and looking for the uh, legitimate threats. And that's what keeps us up at night. Right. And, and understand and think about that. You know, knowing the bad guys know how to manipulate us with large amounts. And one, remember, they're still getting paid for that, mm-hmm. but they're going to get paid for this over here, too. And knowing that any way that we could address anything that they're doing just by providing that overwhelming amount of bodies because they know what that means to us Mm -hmm. how many agents it takes to process how many things it takes to uh, just the logistics of actually watching those individuals Mm -hmm. that's not our that's technically not our job right we get stuck with that but our job is to be out there on the front line and when they see that we're taken away from doing that they just sit back and laugh honestly so before we go on to the other uh, subjects that I had written down, there's a bunch of things I want to talk to you about. Right. I want to give everybody a little glimpse of, of kind of your career sure. in, in a snapshot. So before you had this position, you were with the Operations Support Office of the Chief Medical Officer for CBP. Now that's very relevant given the COVID pandemic environment right. that we've been in here. So what did you do with, uh, with the Chief Medical Officer? So there was a requirement out there to make sure that we had our medical records. We're seeing now we are, as the Border Patrol, responsible for thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, right, and their medical care. So what we found was there was just inconsistencies because it was on paper documentation, things that we, because we were not traditionally responsible for those things. But because we had that as a gap, we identified that as a requirement. Congress actually funded and said we need to have an electronic medical record system that's specific to what we're doing. A little bit outside of my wheelhouse, as far as the medical piece and and understanding, I knew what we were doing in processing, but understanding that we had to now leverage all of our stakeholders within the OIT system and our partners in in every piece of integration with creating that electronic medical record within our system of record, right? So how do we take this information, put it into one of our systems that can be discoverable so we can not only to help save lives and have records of these individuals and, and we're able to see and provide quality care, but it's consistent across the border. So working with multiple stakeholders within CBP and, and DHS, we identified a system to work with our partners uh, in the medical field that uh, through best practices that were out there, uh, and we developed this electronic medical record system that's being implemented across the southwest border. And I can do it by no means take credit for that. There's a bunch of great subject matter experts that knew how to get that done, and working with them was a, a great experience. But I could say we're getting there, and we're actually, we have implemented that across the southwest border. But you know what, it just, we talk about having to deal with this uh, pandemic with, yes. with COVID-19, and, and everybody in the world has had to deal with it in some form or fashion, but you just add a level of complexity with what you're talking about, yes, sir. a way that CBP has had to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic in a way that many other organizations have not. Yes, sir. And a lot of this stuff is in typical uh, fashion. We, we learn as we go and, mm-hmm. and try and get better at it so that next time yes, sir. something like this happens, yes, sir. we're better off for it. And honestly, sir, those Border Patrol agents that are working to get this done and identifying what they could do to make it better, to include the medical wristbands. It's a wristband system that identifies how we are um, identifying these migrants as they come in, and we put a specific band on them so we know who and where they are and what they go. And then we, we, we also did that to where it's a, a medical wristband, so how we go about having a way of ensuring that these people are given the best amount of care and that we're properly documenting. The medical aspect has never been yep. your favorite topic to no, deal sir. with. No, <laughs> sir. Uh, and, and the reason I was brought through and to, I feel that they brought me in to do that, was to just be able to take the experiences I have from out there in the field and knowing how to plan, coordinate, and execute that across multiple disciplines and honestly find the right people that know how to, to get those sure. things done mm-hmm. and then just give them what they need to let that happen. And that's that was my goal is to find the people that knew how to do it, boss, and and give and empower them to do their job, and just get everybody in the room to where we could figure that out and get that done. So it was it worked out well, and and they're continuing to run with that. I was able to identify a specific uh, individual to come and take that take that over from me, and I think uh, that's one of the big things that I like to try to do is identify who could always do this better than I could because there's plenty of them out there. So I'm identifying who's going to take this over from me and just make it better and uh, we've got Craig Shepley in there that's doing that right now and I know you know good Craig man. well good man. Yep. so he's taking and running that with uh, some great folks uh, on that team and they're um, they're running with that program right now along with Dr. Tarantino and, and the oversight from that our office of chief medical officer they've 
he's ran with it and been the, the large advocate to get this done for the whole um, um, for a while. He identified what this specific vulnerability gap or this gap that we had. And then that was the reason he brought me in to help get that done. And, and the, his foresight and his leadership has helped us get there. So before that, you were the director of the Alliance to Combat Transnational Threats for the Rio Grande Valley sector. Now, that's another important position that I yes, want sir. to talk about here in a second. But let me go down the rest first. Okay. We'll come back to it. Uh, prior to that, detailed to the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Policy, Strategy, Plans, Analysis, and Risk. That sounds uh, very easy. <laughs> and then before that, you were the... Uh, you were the assistant chief at headquarters Border Patrol and served as a, basically a corridor liaison for South Texas, one of the busiest area at the time. Uh, you've been a patrol agent in charge for the Special Operations Detachment in uh, Del Rio sector. You were an assistant chief in Del Rio sector. You were the deputy patrol agent in charge of the Brackettville station. You were a field operations supervisor at uh, Bortac headquarters, near and dear to my heart. I did the same same job yes, there sir. for a while. You were a supervisory border patrol agent at uh, Tucson, uh, Arizona, back when Tucson was the, the busy sector, right. much like RGV is today. You entered on duty with the United States Border Patrol in 1996 as a member of Class 304. Do you remember your chant? Tucson Sector 304, guarding the border forevermore. Ladies and gentlemen, that's 25 years later, and he came up just like that. I was the one that came up with it, so oh. I had to make sure I had it. I was <laughs> a section leader, so you know how that goes. Yeah, and, and that was... Well, so you were the section leader, yeah. I'm guessing, because prior to joining the Border Patrol, you served on active duty with the United States Marine Corps as an infantry squad leader for the 1st Battalion, 6th Marine Regiment in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Yes, sir. Four or six years? How long did you do that? I did a four-year four uh, enlistment, yes, sir. So you are at about 29 years of federal service. Absolutely, yes, sir. Time flies. Though. It is crazy. Crazy. That it is. So, obviously, a very diverse background, and you have been in ground zero where, when, when things are happening. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, some would say a, a very difficult career, but, you know, some would say a very blessed career because yes, you've had a chance to really do the job that we all signed up to do. Absolutely. So, let's go to that, uh, the ACTT director, the Alliance to Combat Transnational Threats, because what I want to talk about there is that piece that we kind of touched on before, mm -hmm. where you have the conventional operations, where that's mm -hmm. the things that people see in public. They sure. see... Uh, the agents driving around in the green and white vehicles. Mm -hmm. They see the uh, Office of Field Operations working at the ports of entry. They see the Air Marine operations, the helicopters, and the and the, and the vessels on mm -hmm. the, on the on the water. But that effort to take down the transnational criminal organizations, the smugglers, the actual people responsible for the flow, that was your wheelhouse as the yes. ACTT director. Talk about that and what you did in the Rio Grande Valley sector. I think that was one of the better opportunities uh, of my career, and it was Chief Rudy Karish that brought me down because, of course, RGV being that area and the very significant threats that are associated to that area in general. As the ACTT director, I had the ability to work with all of our state, local, and other federal partners in there to kind of prioritize and identify who those priority threats were within that specific region that we could all sit down and agree that these organizations were the ones that were causing us the most significant impact, whether it was narcotics, human smuggling, uh, even weapons going south. We sat down as a group together and identified what is some of the most significant players in this area and develop a tactical operation to address those specific organizations. And so there's all obviously a multitude of organizations out there that are probably too many to count. Absolutely. And you have each of our stakeholders, our law enforcement partners, mm -hmm. and, and they have their own mission sets, yes, just sir. like we do. Yes, sir. And so the idea is to find what organization touches on all of our mission sets mm -hmm. that we have a mutual benefit to go after and take down and get the biggest bang for our buck. The added benefit, because you alluded to it takes a network to defeat a network. Yes, sir. We have certain uh, law enforcement authorities. Uh, DEA has certain law yes, enforcement sir. authorities. The Internal Revenue Service has certain law enforcement authorities. Anything and everything we can take and throw at the bad guys yes. to disrupt, degrade, yep. and dismantle their capabilities yes, sir. is what we're going to do. And that's what you were all about. And it was, and it was, and, and having the ability, and, and that kind of goes to some of those things that those Border Patrol agents out there, of the opportunities that are out there, right? I was able to identify team, or, and this was being worked on by my predecessor, John, the other John Morris. Mm -hmm. That's Not, funny. Yeah, it's funny, right? So it, it, uh, I refer to him as the bigger, less attractive John Morris. <laughs> I'm sure but, he'll listen. Oh, yes, yeah, right. But, but they worked to establish what we call the Sting Unit, and this, this unit was a hand-picked group of individuals to specifically go after these guys and go after these organizations within a very 
small area because we have very limited resources. So given those agents the latitude to figure out who the bad guys were in an area, how we could actually attack them through, like you said, all of those partners, whether it was through our CIS capabilities or revoking visas or whatever we could do to identify, to attack that network, to create and cause uh, disruption to where they would not be affecting the area to, to that point. And in essence, what you're doing is you're creating a consequence for that, that group or that network existing and doing their illicit trade. Yes, sir. And we don't care as law enforcement officers what the consequence is or who gets credit for it. We simply want the end result of that group ceases to operate. Right. And, and working with all the stakeholders in that area, everything is built on relationships, at, especially at those local levels. And the great group of individuals that were down there to where we could all decide that, hey, we, we feel that we can get together to affect this org- these organizations. Uh, it was a great opportunity and a great effort, and being able to work through that whole South Texas region with Laredo, Del Rio, all the way over into New Orleans and working with uh, Chief Bovino over there at the time um, to identify how we could, because of Houston being such a huge hub for all of this activity, and how we could look at that regionally to affect those organizations in that area. And it was a great opportunity, and there's a lot of great agents that uh, that within that South Texas corridor and with that, uh, within that area that uh, continue to, go, to do great work down there. And this is the kind of work that goes on behind the scenes every day that yep. a lot of folks will never have visibility on but has a dramatic impact on border security, national security, indeed the safety and security of everybody that lives in this country. It's hard to, to get folks to, and to, to realize how hard is it to actually, they may see on TV setting the stake out to follow vehicles out, but getting that pattern of life on big guy, on bad guys, so you can see where they're going to pick up these smoke, these aliens, or how their how their day to day activities uh, are playing out, so we can have that consequence. It's time consuming. It's uh, very difficult, and especially in that region where it's been going on for for decades. And to do that type of work, to be uh, well, to work in the Office of Intelligence and to be the agent that goes and does that type of surveillance, act, such a level of dedication and a passion for that type of work that it takes for somebody to be able to do it and do it well. And we have many that do it each and every day. And you see that, it, and it's not a uh, eight to four job. No, no. Those guys, once they they are stuck, they're stuck, and they want to be stuck there. They just, and we kind of all been there, and we worked the amount of hours that nobody could ever imagine that because we just would rather be there than anywhere else. And then the other side of it, on the non-uniform side, Mm -hmm. we have intelligence analysts, just like any other uh, law enforcement or military organization does. And these folks, they just sift through all the data and they come up with good, actionable intel, what it takes to be able to do that job well. And we are very blessed in the Office of Intelligence and CBP to have a number of them that are just outstanding. It's amazing to me to understand the amount of data that they research to provide us that information that turns into action. And it's a it's an art and a dedication that they have of their own and, and how much they want to provide that information. And, and honestly, we couldn't do what we do without them. And a lot of them are, are veterans, prior military. Sure, of course. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a skill that's learned and applied in the military and, uh, and has a very definite application over on the law enforcement side. So if somebody wants to come to work for CBP, they don't all have to wear a Border Patrol uniform True. or OFO uniform or Air Marine. They can go to work as a, an analyst yep. with, uh, with, with CBP and a multitude of other offices that exist out there. Sure. One of the 60-plus thousand men and women that, that go to work every day in service to this country. Yes, sir. Amazing stuff. Yes, sir. Let's dial back a little bit, and I want to talk about your time as a member of the Border Patrol Tactical Unit and, before mm-hmm. that, a member of the Tucson Special Response Team. Now, the special response teams are also called BORTAC teams. Yes, sir. Before that, there was two different standards and two different uh, teams. Yes, sir. You spent a long time as a member of the Tucson Special Response Team. And as I said before, that's back when Tucson was, was really, really busy. I think the, as a foreign of years, as a young agent, that time I spent in Arizona kind of laid the foundation for me for the rest of my career. The amount of traffic we were seeing at the time, the different areas and how diverse the areas are in that southern Arizona. Uh, I don't think a lot of uh, a lot of folks out there realize the the vast amounts of area that we're responsible for. Huge. Yeah. And it's hard to to really even explain it until unless you've driven it or been out there in it. How for one minute you can be in 
the, the dunes uh, of Ajo out there uh, to the next being in the San Rafael Valley south of uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona, where it looks like it looks like Montana, green grass, uh, a huge valley up against the Huachuca Mountains, and knowing that all of those areas were exploited. And it was a great place to learn to be an agent. Um, the true tracking uh, a skill set, That's that was one of the things that I really was blessed with being able to do. I grew up in, in that sign of kind of wanting to be able to do those things and was able to do that out there. It was a great time to be an agent. So before I talk about the actual job on the SRT sure. team, Bortec team, so you went through and graduated Bortec selection course 16. Yes, sir. Now, knowing that class 15 was the most difficult, how <laughs> difficult was it to come after that? Well, and, and, and knowing <laughs> that, uh, you know, we had to somehow measure up to 15. It was The bar wasn't that high, so it was all right. So, uh, it, it so for those that don't know, I, I graduated from class 15, and, and Mo came on uh, class 16 right after me. And there's yep. a running joke with the uh, w among uh, members of Bortec which class was the hardest. So there's probably uh, guys listening out there right now that are rolling their eyes oh, yeah. at uh, me even hinting at that. But no, they're all equally uh, difficult, and it's a true accomplishment to finish. Well, and, and knowing and being a part of those selection courses, right? For whether between SRT and Bortec being, you know, part of 14 different selection courses, either running the course or knowing everything that it takes to make one of those happen, and then seeing where the team is taking it to these days and how it's amazing, how professional and all the lessons learned and how the products that those guys are turning out. It's uh, I, I, again, those guys are run circles around us, I'm sure. Well, and I tell you, and I say this a lot, they, you want to see that the that the group and the generation that comes after you is better, yep. better prepared, better trained, yes, sir. just does things better because that's the environment that uh, that they find themselves in and the way the environment itself has evolved. Yep. And I tell you what, on the spec ops side for Border Patrol, CBP in general, we can say that easily. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think the guys have done a great job out there, and uh, I know a lot of them and trained a lot of them, and it's great to see where they are now. Yep. 100% agree. So the time that you were out there, you spent in, in the in the deserts of Tucson, and I want to bring this up because it kind of illustrates the threats that exist out there, not mm. just to us mm. doing the job on patrol, but to people entering the country illegally, yes. uh, to the members of the community. Yes, sir. Now, for those that don't know, uh, Brian Terry, the, the very first uh, BORTAC agent to be killed in the line of duty, he was a member of the Tucson Special Response Team. 2010, he was killed in the line of duty, and he was out on a, an operation countering bandit activity that was very common, probably still is in some of those areas in, yes, in, the, in the deserts of Tucson. Talk about what the bandits and that, that, whole, uh, that whole scenario is and, and the dangers that the, that the folks coming across illegally will face on that side of things. So prior to 2010, we were being we were brought in, uh, and, and this is all the way back in 2007. It really wasn't nothing new to that specific area because it's just so remote and so hard to, to work. But basically what has happened is the cartels and the narcotics traffickers understood and knew when groups of backpackers or groups of narcotics will be coming through a specific area. Through they, man, their, their, their goal was to rip off their partners or their competitors' narcotics, right? Mm -hmm. So what they would do is they would go up into the mountains. And the reason I know this is because we specifically picked these agent, these guys off out uh, off the highway. So we would see them. We, we were set up in our observation posts, uh, and we watched where this group got dropped off um, from a van had a bunch of weapons and backpacks, and then they started headed off up into the mountains. So we were able to interdict them, and they they had you know AK-47s, um, SKSs, um, backpacks full of weapons and food, and, and they, no qualms about using them. Oh, absolutely not. And we had already been uh, we had already been engaged in that area uh, um, prior to that or during this operation. We had already we had, had engagements with those guys. So. And interviewing with them is they were from gangs in Phoenix. They were getting dropped off. They knew that there was going to be narcotics coming. And what they would do is they would wait for whether it was immigrants or those narcotics, it was targets of opportunity to them. They would uh, wait for the, the narcotics to come by. They would just open up on them with AK-47s or their weapons, kill them or interrogate them. We found them where they had shot them in the back of the head and tossed them off the side of a hill um, just to get the information on where the narcotics were so they could take it for themselves and, and head back out. And, and this is on our border. This is uh, called KP-29, 
29 kilometer marker, right? 29 up Highway 19 um, or Interstate 19 coming up on the Nogales, but they ran through this area with impunity. Um, and that was the reason we got brought in to, to address that situation because we would get dropped off uh, and be in the field for a week or two at a time uh, to try to find and identify these, these individuals. And remembering the hard part for us is that we have to bring that to a law enforcement resolution. We're not in Afghanistan. We're not military. Nope. We can't. Uh, I can tell you as being a former infantry Marine and what you're trained to do when you are setting up in ambush um, for enemy combatants to come into a kill zone, I could tell you what you do to address uh, to address that in an enemy combat zone. We can't do that as law enforcement agents. That's officers. not our job. That's not our nope. rules of engagement. Again, talking about operating on your heels. So even uh, it was back in 07 where I was involved in an incident where individual, same thing. We saw them coming up the, uh, uh, the gas line. Um, they were moving in a military-type formation, two individuals in front, the rest of the group in behind. And sure enough, that individual in the lead was on patrol. And what I mean by that is his job as a point man was looking to the left and looking to the right and looking for anybody that was going to uh, interfere with what he was doing. And we were set up in a linear interjection with a four-man element to address these individuals. And that guy looked right over at me under a three-quarter loom in an Arizona night. And for some of you, you'll, you'll understand this, how bright that is out there. And in February, when there's no concealment anywhere, I was set up in a sitting position. And he reached in his pocket and pulled out a three fifty seven and started shooting at me. So we engaged in a gunfight, and I was able to successfully use my training that we had done thousands and thousands of repetitions over to successfully get me through that situation and had our team come down and do the same repetitions because of the training that we had been taught. We got through that situation, and we were able to apprehend all the individuals that were associated with that, and, uh, and unfortunately, that bad guy lost his life. But all over 38 pounds of marijuana that he had on his back. You had to use deadly force. Yes, sir. And, you know, I, I do want to talk about that in a second, but paint the picture for everybody else here that you're, you're out there in the middle of the desert, no cover and concealment, mm. and you had an individual who pulled a weapon and had no qualms about opening up and firing at you. It's trying to kill you. Absolutely. That's the type of adversary that is out there along the border in these different areas, and they don't care if it's law enforcement. They don't care if it's migrants. They don't care if it's members of the community. There are criminal elements out there every day doing that exact same thing. That was, and the reason why this this wasn't the first time. We'd found body after body in that area because they would, it's, again, impunity. And that guy didn't care whether I was a Border Patrol agent or whether I was just some lost individual sitting on the side of a gas line road. He pulled out a weapon and was really to kill me for that. And those are the things that our Border Patrol agents and OFO, all of our agents have to deal with on a day-in and day-out basis. And it just happened again recently. Where bad guys, they don't care. It's all about getting their commodity across. And honestly, they feel emboldened. And they continue to push us, and we'll continue to have to react. It's the training that we go through. I know I felt confident because of the training I had and, and just being able to drive my weapon system, and I was confident with that. What I was worried about, and I can tell you honestly, was making sure, okay, did I see the weapon? Was I writing my memo? Did I, I was more worried, I can tell you honestly, about making sure that I had my articulable facts, that I could write my memo so I didn't get in trouble because this guy was shooting at me. I was more worried about that. I felt I could drive this guy, but because um, I, I was confident in my, but I was really worried about, I got to be able to make sure I have all my facts in line so I don't get in trouble. So these are the things that go through a law enforcement officer's mind that do not go to the mind of those that we come up against, that Absolutely. we face. Yeah. And that puts us behind the curve. On the, <laughs> We have to respond. We have yes. to react. And we have to do it oftentimes with one hand tied behind our back. And there's no way that anybody can know what that feels like unless you are in that situation with that training and those things are going through your mind. Yep. And knowing, knowing the second that it happens, you're going to be second-guessed. You're going to be armchair quarterbacked. Everybody is going to, you will be underneath a magnifying glass every single time. And see, knowing that, and this is something I think is important. 
even knowing that, you still have people that sign up each and every day willing to serve, willing to go out and do this job. Yeah. The odds are stacked against you. And a lot of times, all we had to rely on is each other. We have this law enforcement profession, this brotherhood, this fraternity that, uh, that, that keeps us going in tough times. Mm -hmm. But isn't it amazing that in that moment where your life was on the line, the things you were worried about was, am I going to get in trouble for saving my own life? It's tough knowing that that's what I was worried about. I was confident in everything else, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't lose my job, I didn't disgrace my family, and I was worried about my teammates. My teammates and those guys sent to my left and right. I wanted to make sure that I was doing everything I was trained right to make sure that we all went home. Who else has to worry about this when they go to their job? And then go home to your, uh, to your family. How do you explain that? How do you talk about what your day was like when it was yes. a day like that? It's an experience, and that comes back to the family that we have family in green and the family at home that family in green automatically wraps around you we have mechanisms in place to make sure that our folks are taken care of when these things happen I could say I was fully supported with that um, it made me feel good knowing that my leadership had my back and I saw certain things play out knowing that and it made me feel you know at least made me feel good that I knew that my leadership had my back and, and I was I was grateful for that so another of your teammates that was involved in a very similar situation, Brian Terry. Yes, sir. This is one of those situations where an individual had no qualms, again, about opening up and firing on a law enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. And he lost his life as a result of that. I feel, uh, you know, there's been many different after-action reviews and lessons learned from that. I can tell you being in a horrible position of trying to come up with contingencies of how we, as law enforcement officers, bring that to a resolution. How do you address seven armed men with AK-47s as a four-man element to bring that to a law enforcement resolution without endangering you and your team? How do you do that? So going through the contingencies, and that's our responsibility is the tactical element. We were looking at different ways of how we could do that. We know we have been successful in the past of using certain less lethal devices to maybe try to because remember, I mean, I can be honest, what they would do is drop their weapons and take off running. Well, how? And then from then, we can't pursue because we have to worry about officer safety. And how do we do this? And how can we? And often they would just, they would, and it's hard for people to imagine, but they just, they just disappear into the desert. So just to kind of paint that picture, because what you're saying is very, very powerful. So here's a group of individuals that are armed to the teeth with automatic weapons, AK-47s. And they're out there with full intent to mm -hmm. kill or hurt anybody that gets in their way. Yes, sir. And if they get the drop on you, great. They shoot you, they kill you, they go on about their business. If you get the drop on them, they drop their weapons real quick, take off and run. You think twice about chasing them. Why? Because now there's a bunch of AK-47s on the ground, and you don't know if they have more weapons on them that they could turn around and fire while yeah, you're running so, after them. So you, you have to do it tactically. And doing that tactically means you don't run after them, right? You go so, slow. And so, and what does that do? It gives them the opportunity to escape. And, and we continued to see that. We were always dealing with these guys would escape. So we're trying to come up with different contingencies on how we could physically take their capability of doing that, whether it was, you know, bean bag rounds to the, you know, to the lower extremities. Because it was frustrating not being able to put hands on those bad guys because they would just disappear. So trying to put yourself to where you have to address those as contingencies. Folks don't understand in, in these canyons and in these remote areas, there's not a squad car backup that's 30 seconds out. Or an ambulance that's minutes away. No, you're on your own in those areas, and you have to figure out how you're going to address it with the team and the tools that you have right then. And we're on the back foot, I can tell you. So it's it's trying to figure out ways to do that in that situation was horrible again, because what happens, those guys engage us, drop their weapons and take off. And when they had engaged us, unfortunately they hit one of our teammates who lost his life in the hands of his brothers right there on the sand of that hill. And it, I mean, in, in I know most of us that wear this uniform for any length of time have, have heard this story, but mm -hmm. just for everybody else that doesn't, he was wearing his vest. Absolutely, yes, sir. And uh, where he was hit was an area where he was not protected. Mm -hmm. And had he been right there by a hospital, there's probably still nothing that uh, yes, that could have been done. High power rifle uh, that, uh, that that killed Brian Terry, and he became the first war attack agent to lose his life in the line of duty. Yes, and sir. It's, uh, he, he's somebody that we honor and remember every single day. But 
those two examples that you talked about right now, of having to use deadly force, and then uh, you know Brian Terry's death. That's the threat that's out there. That's what goes through the minds of not just every Border Patrol agent, but every law enforcement officer when they go out in the field, that that could happen. There, there are instances and people out there that will do that. Now, let's put that up against the backdrop of, is everybody that comes across the border illegally bad? Absolutely not. No. Now, there are people that are coming across looking for a better way of life, just like there are people coming across with malintent. Yes, sir. How do you know who's who? Look at what we have to deal with right now. Imagine that agent that has been dealing with for the past, we're going on multiple years now, of huge surges of people just bring walking across and giving themselves up to them. You kind of get into a rhythm of all these people that are giving themselves up, and it's just another group you have to go out there and deal with of now processing these folks, except for the time that you walk down and then you get engaged. We have to sift through the hundreds of thousands of people that are coming and then still have to deal with bad guy and then still, again, be put under that microscope for doing so. Yep, and have your have your judgment questioned at yes. every turn afterwards. Yep. Hence the frustration of our men and women that are out there doing this. Job. Sure, and again, like you said, we do it willingly, and there's still those of us that want to go out there and do it every day because we know what it means. We're securing our nation. That is our line, and the laws say we have to do it legally. We're out there to keep illegal activity coming into our country, no matter what it is. Because that's the line that we stand on, and that's our job to do. And we want to go out there and do it. So that's a good segue into something very important, uh, I know, to you and, and to us uh, that, that wear this uniform. Mm -hmm. And that's our guiding principle. That's our, uh, our, yeah. our motto, honor first. Sure. Because you talk about what it takes to continue to get up and go do this job in the face of everything that we've mm -hmm. talked about so far. And that can only happen if we are part of something special, if we're part of something bigger than ourselves, if we continue to have that that belief that we're serving our fellow man and that we're serving our country, honor first is something that is ingrained in everybody that goes through these uh, these gates at the academy. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not just a a buzzword. Mm -hmm. It's not just a tagline on your email right. address. It's it's something that guides our judgment and our actions on and off duty. Sure. Somebody's got 25 years in the Border Patrol and has done all the things that you've done for the new trainees that are listening or people mm -hmm. that are thinking about joining or people who just want to know, get a look into our psyche as Border Patrol agents, talk to them about what Honor First is to you. So knowing you're stepping into a uniform that's been around since 1924 that has been guarding this country, knowing that you're, you're setting yourself in in a legendary group. It's your responsibility to uphold that patch and that badge with a sense of integrity and honor. And I know for me it was really ingrained, you know, for me in, in the Marine Corps, you know, we've Semper Fidelis, always faithful. So that just translated automatically for me and honor first, knowing that I would not bring discredit upon myself, my teammates, my fellow agents, or my uniform, and, or my family. Knowing that integrity is everything. Your integrity is what you have as a person to ensure that what you're doing is right. And we do the right thing for the right reasons. And that integrity is its something for me, it's, it's just, a, it's a given. I'm not going to... I'm, Make no mistake. We all make mistakes, and I know you know me well enough to know that I've made some of my own. I understand that you make mis uh, made mistakes, and, and owning up to those mistakes and say, hey, I'm accountable. I feel here's what I did, and we all heard those stories of, hey, man, you don't break. If you screw up, you know, just don't break. Well, no, nah, man, we all screw up. That's a powerful message. We all screw up. Oh. Own up to it. Be accountable for it. Take your licks and know uh, that – I'm going to be better the next time. Or I'm going to learn from it, and I guarantee you, your leadership, they've all made mistakes, and they are very understanding of that. But they want to know that we have that integrity to say, yep, I made a mistake. This is what I learned from it. But give me another chance, boss, so I can do better. 
and that's what that's what it is. So we were talking earlier. I mean, it, it's 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 a very very powerful message that yes, we all make mistakes. Mm-hmm. You own up. Mm-hmm. You learn from it, yes. and you move on. But you said earlier, you can't get your integrity back once it's gone. Yeah. Cover up and don't take accountability for your actions. You lose that integrity, and when you lose that integrity, you lose the public's trust. Absolutely. And you cannot be a law enforcement officer if you don't have the public's trust. And it's such a powerful word, and we, we've heard that do the right thing for the right reasons, but it's it's really pretty easy to do it when you think about that. Now, you're going to be put in these agents, for everybody that's out there, you'll be put in tough situations where you're going to have to make some judgment calls very quickly. And you do the right thing for the right reasons, and if it turns out that it was a mistake, you say, hey, I, I'm, it was a judgment call that I made, and I know I now that I made a mistake. I own it. Let's, uh, let's move forward so I can do better. And everybody's going to respect that, and as long as you still have what? Your integrity. And that's, and I guess, you know, in terms of CBP's core values, sure. integrity is actually one of those three. Yes, sir. You have honor first for the Border Patrol, and above that, the CBP core values, you have uh, service, integrity, and vigilance. And so it, it, there's a reason why that's in our, uh, our, our core principles all the way up and down. Yes, sir. So, you know, we talk about, you know, the importance of being a public servant and, and conserving that, uh, that public trust. You know, in the last year, year and a half or so, it's been a tough time for law enforcement because there's a lot of scrutiny due to the actions of a, of a few people mm-hmm. that, uh, uh, you know, I don't think represent the uh, the entirety of law enforcement as a profession. I don't think that they certainly represent the men and women of the United States Border Patrol. And what I tell all the trainees that, that I talk to coming in, and I think you probably would agree, you look at any group of people in this country and of everybody, when somebody tarnishes the law enforcement profession, a badge, a, a patch, there's nobody that gets angrier or that feels it at a more personal level than those of us that wear the badge. I grew up a cop's kid in San Angelo, Texas. I watched my dad um, be a police officer in that town um, my, my entire youth and how proud I was to be able to say my dad was a cop. I was so proud of that. Um, knowing what he did day in and day out at that local level, um, I think that Nobody wants to root out bad people more than those of us that wear that badge. Yeah. And I feel that if somebody has chosen that path, we're going to find you. We don't want you in our group. Well said. Yes, sir. Couldn't have said it better. So you have trainees listening that are we're passing the baton to them. You know, we've yes, both sir. been in 25 years, and yeah. this is these are going to be the folks that take the mantle and, uh, and and carry this organization and our legacy forward. They're listening right now, and so are the uh, the men and women that are continuing to go out and do this job each and every day. Any words of wisdom or, or message you want to give them? Just that you're stepping into a family. Everybody wants what the Border Patrol has when it comes to the traditions and the sense of family when you step into this green uniform. I was proud enough to be able to come and watch one of the kids that my daughter grew up with and pin his badge on not too long ago and being able to look at his his parents and say, you're now in the family. And then that's what we are. We take care of each other. We look out for each other. We're brothers and sisters, and we sometimes fight like brothers and sisters. That's true. <laughs> but nobody is going to be able to come at us when we have our brothers and our sisters to our left and our right. So remember, you're stepping into that uniform. Be worthy of that brother and sister moniker. Mo, it's good to see you, brother. I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. I uh, hope I didn't mess it up too much for you, Chief. I think you did outstanding, probably better than I could ever hope to do. <laughs> I'll do that, sir. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it for another episode of What's Important Now. We'll talk again soon, but until then, stay safe out there. It can be dangerous, but it's worth it. This country's worth it. Honor first. Thank you.